Hey everyone, my name is Gabrielle Thalen and welcome to my Untop Live. In today's session, I'm going to go over the creation of an eggshell mold and going to work you through that workflow, show you the highlights of it, but I'm really going to focus on notebook best practices and how to really create parametric and reusable workflows that enable automation in any sort of um, application. So even going outside of eggshell mold creation. So before I jump into the software and show you the magic, um, I'm going to go over what even an eggshell mold is. So what's an eggshell mold? Um, essentially, it's a one-time use, thin-walled, 3D printed mold, and it's often injected with silicone and then broken away. So extremely thin-walled, you could practically break it away with just your hands. Um, why I'm focusing on this today or why this is a cool application is because the current design processes are very tedious. Um, a lot of fragile Boolean operations in other tools, complications in generating like structural ribbing, because when you're creating this mold and you're injecting with silicone, um, the structural ribbing there is there so that it just the mold doesn't start breaking even in the process of injecting silicone into it. And so when you start having really complex surfaces, so in this example today, I'm going to be showing um, shoe insoles and the bottom of shoe insoles. If you get really cool texturing or really cool designs, it can be really complicated. And when you try to generate structural ribbing for that in CAD, it becomes really tedious and cumbersome and time consuming. Um, so with an end topology, being able to generate the structural ribbing, these Boolean operations, they're gonna be really seamless. And you'll see that when we get into the software. Lastly, you need injection and exhaust ports for the molds. So you have to need a place to inject the silicone and then also exhaust ports for um, like getting the fumes or other applications there. Uh, the location on those ports, they sometimes change depending on what kind of mold you have. So that kind of control for the designer to place those ports and essentially cut it, cut those portholes out from the mold is um, really important. So I'll show that how that's done with an end topology. So I'm going to quickly just show you uh, the results. I was able to build a workflow that automated this process, the, the placement of these ports, the generation of the structural ribbing, and then also create a workflow that's reusable on any sort of import or shoe. In this, again, this case, shoe insoles. So I'm going to show you um, this workflow. And then I think it's also important to note that this is, it can go beyond just sole, shoe sole creation. There's a lot of other applications like within the medical industry. Um, where this would be applicable. So let's get into the fun stuff and get into the software. All right, we're in the software. And as you can see, we're looking at my actual mold. So here's my exhaust port. Here's my injection port. To be honest, my exhaust port's kind of big when I modeled it, but you'll get the point. Um, let's give you a section cut of this thing and show you this cavity that I've created for my eggshell mold. So here we can see, here's the eggshell mold. Basically, this is where the silicone is being injected. On the outside here, we see structural ribbing. Um, I can control the width and the height of this. You'll see this when I get into my variable creation. But then you can see the structural ribbing is conforming very nicely to kind of the craziness of this uh, shoe sole here. So let's walk you through the, the workflow. Um, again, not, notebook best practices is section creation. So I have these sections that I can expand and collapse. And there's one starting off with part import implicit conversion. So I import my outsole. I import my injection exhaust ports. I convert them to implicit. That's kind of the, the reoccurring story here when working on topology. Once we get into implicit, we can start doing the really complex modeling stuff. So again, Variable creation, it's extremely important. The more variables you create for like really important parameters or blocks, the easier your life is gonna be. For example, the offset distance, this is the distance of my cavity here. I made a variable for that. Um, this is some meshing stuff that I've done, split mesh. I'm not gonna go into the weeds of that. Um, basically, I'm just isolating the outer mesh of uh, my geometry for when I create my ribs later, because I'm doing a lot of like Boolean operations, I'm offsetting, I'm doing a Boolean subtract to create the actual mold. And then for the creation of the ribs, 
Um, I'm essentially, I have this box here that I've just generated. I've used properties from other blocks. So you'll notice that this width and height will change within the box depending on my import. And the reason being so is because I'm using properties from other box or blocks. I mean, so for example, I'm looking at the mold and I'm looking at its bounding box and I'm looking at the max point of that bounding box box. And the way I'm able to do this, if we go into our mold, and if I go to properties, we have this bounding box properties. And if I expand that, we have a wealth of information here, the max point, the min point, the coordinates, the XYZ coordinates of that max point. So if I am able to use the bounding box of my mold variable within the properties of other blocks, this creates an extremely parametric workflow because if that mold changes, well, that bounding box will adapt based on the, the new mold that's brought in or the new shoe and sole, sole that's brought in. And therefore, these parameters or variables down here will update based off of that new bounding box. So instead of like hard coding values in, um, which if you're kind of speaking like pro programming talk with me, when you hard code values, that's not, um, not really a parametric workflow and you're gonna have to go back and continually change values. Where here, if I'm using parameters from um, other variables, I'm really creating an extremely parametric reusable workflow. So again, best practices, creating variables, linking, um, using properties from those variables and linking them in other areas of our notebook. It's just gonna make your life extremely easy when we get a new shoe import um, or any sort of it, geometry import for other applications. So I generated a box using those block properties um, then I arrayed them. So let's see that I array these blocks, these, this box. And then I do a little remap field to basically get the other side of those boxes here. And then through some more Boolean operations, some offsetting, I'm able to intersect um, those ribs based off of rib height, rib thickness. And again, creating variables for that, in which I'm now able to create these nice ribs here that conform nicely very nicely to my my mold so let me just propagate my final soul here and then talk about our next section here inlet and outlet port uh, placement operations so i'm able to orient well here i was able to do some hole punching operations this is that section here um, again using axes using orient objects but let's focus more on the injection and exhaust ports here. So you'll see I have these variables for control points. Um, essentially, I'm able to use other blocks within end topology. If I expand this, um, we have this block called closest point. And basically, it asks for a body and then a control point, aka this control point, and then finds the closest point on the, that surface of that body. The reason I do that is that I can then evaluate the field gradient at that point to then align my injection port and, and exhaust ports so that they're always going to be normal to this mold. So definitely, if you open up this top file, explore this a little bit more. But again, using variables, linking these in different areas um, is really important. So same operation for the exhaust port. Pretty much the same thing with the punch holes. I just took cylinders, um, used that closest point, then did some boolean subtract, create those hole punches, and then we get a final sole. That's nice here. We got it, our ports. Um, we have this nice, the structural ribbing, and then I'll show that we can import a completely different sole and have the workflow completely rerun. So let's get that other sole. I go back to my part import, expand our import sole variable. Let's select this folder, bring this in, let it load in, and let end topology run. All right, we have our new sole. The only thing that I need to fix here are my inlet and outlet port locations. So let's quickly just move this point over here, maybe. See what that looks like. Nice. And probably move this one down a little bit. Let's take this control point, 
Move that down a bit. And that'll work. And then let's actually section cut this thing and I'll show you that the workflow did run, rerun. Created that cavity. I can change the offset di distance if I want to maybe thin these walls out. But as you can see, the structural ribbing creation, like this is a vastly different outsole, but these ribs are conforming very nicely. And let me just highlight those. But again, complexity is not an issue when, it, when we're in end topology. And that's all enabled by the implicit model. And just to reiterate, because it's extremely important, variables, notebook, best practices, again, just gonna make your life easy easier when it comes to um, just design in general. Um, but as you can see here, within end topology, we can really create these built out workflows and really handle any sort of geometry import. All right, so those are a few notebook best practices that really enable you to create robust, parametric, and reusable workflows for any sort of application. I hope you enjoyed the video and I thank you for watching. Uh, please make sure to continue watching these live sessions. Don't miss out on new upcoming applications, um, new features of Entopology. Again, thank you for your time.